this talk will be no rocket science, no uh, big touts, but just some clinical things. Uh, hopefully not too new to most of you. I have no conflict of interest. I'm going to give two small case reports from Leuven, nothing to be proud about. Some pathophysiology, the population at risk, and then what can we do to uh, prevent it and to manage it. The first case report, years ago, a uh, middle-aged uh, lady who was severely burned and also severely uh, psychiatrically uh, diseased. And after months in our burn center, she went to uh, rehabilitation uh, with no drugs, only some analgesia. And on a Monday, five weeks later, I got a phone call that she died. She was found dead in the bed in this rehab institution. And there was no clue at all for my colleagues. Only on Friday, someone started a glucose infusion because she had been vomiting again for a week, which was a bit linked to her psychiatric problems. And in fact, upon initiation of the glucose or the dextrose, a V serum potassium had been measured and was 2.9. Is this the refeeding syndrome or just bad medicine? I leave it up to you, but the patient did die. Second case report, a bit different. A young man admitted to our ICU uh, with a muscle disease, recent airway infection, fever, um, and diarrhea, but also a very malignant arrhythmia with VT and maybe a need for a, a left ventricular uh, assist device. That's why he was there, and everybody was looking at his heart, not at his feeding. And during the night, he was intubated because he was exhausted, uh, went into VT, he was shocked. And in the morning, the head nurses came to me because I have a bit of a technical focus, I have an old motorbike, and they had a discussion on whether the defibrillator was broken or not. Because as you can see, it's not his uh, track, but similar. The shock did uh, bring the patient back from ventricular tachycardia into sinus rhythm, but the patient didn't move on the shock. He didn't do like this. Um, and al although he was not uh, under muscle relaxants. So some said the machine is broken and others said it's not. When we looked at the lab values, in fact, the phosphate level was unmeasurable and the patient was paralyzed due to high, uh, low phosphatemia. Nowadays, we do measure the, uh, the admission phosphate routinely, but in these days, we left it up to the discretion or the lack of discretion of the attending physician. <clears throat> and our nurses give uh, potassium substitution with chloride, not with phosphate. So what happens in the refeeding syndrome? Before, while the patient is starved, he lives on ketones and free fatty acids. And in this situation, although there is a low intake of phosphate and vitamins and other trace elements, there is also a low consumption. And the body levels do go down, but the plasma level is still quite acceptable. And the patient can stay for months like this, as has been shown in politi political hunger strikers. But upon reinitiation of feeding, and this can be a glass of Coca-Cola or a dextrose infusion or anything else containing glucose, the patient will switch back to glucose metabolism. The insulin uh, secretion will increase, glucagon will go down. In some centers like ours, insulin will also be added to achieve some kind of glucose control. And this will bring the glucose where it should be, in the cell. However, another hidden effect is the uh, sodium potassium channel moving to the cell membrane and being activated also by insulin, pumping potassium into the cell. And if you don't measure it, and this may be one of the problems, may have been one of the problems in the NI sugar trial, you can have a very low potassium level and fibrillation, which may have killed my patient in the first case. Second thing is that glucose oxidation is called oxidative phosphorylation probably to make us think of the fact that it uses phosphor. And so, at this point, when we switch back to glucose oxidation, we will use much more phosphorus, and so the levels will go down, muscle weakness may occur, and it has been associated, and the reference is lacking, I'm sorry, by Marek, associated with um, um, respiratory weakness and um, need for mechanical ventilation. Finally, the de decarboxylation steps in glucose and some amino acid metabolism requires thiamine, water-soluble vit vitamin, which is uh, lost very fast during starvation, and then at the moment we need it and it's sucked into the cell again, it becomes symptomatic and the patient develops sometimes neurological problems like Wernicke, Korsakoff, and sometimes a wet beriberi, cardiac failure, high lactate, and so on. So this is the refeeding syndrome hypokalemia, hypophosphatemia, low timing, and maybe also hypermagnesemia, 
uh, high hyperglycemia, although this may be adaptive, as has been explained this morning, and a sodium retention and fluid overload. Now, you may say, I will never miss this. However, example given, a patient 10 days after initial surgery who stayed in your hospital for 10 days and then comes back during the night after revision for peritonitis, will have abdominal pain, but this is normal because he has got a peritonitis may have stupor and cramps and weakness, but he will be sedated and ventilated, so you will not know it. And he will have an eye lactate, but this is what you're treating because it's in a septic shock. So I'm not sure that every doctor in training at four o'clock in the night in this situation will immediately recognize the three symptoms of the refeeding syndrome. And that is why maybe it's safer to make it foolproof or a bit dumb and give time into everybody. Because who is at risk? Well, so I recognize these patients from far away. This girl didn't have anorexia, but burns. And of course, anorexia, I guess, I hope everybody thinks about timing. When they admit a patient with anorexia, 10% of them in the ICU do develop um, a uh, refeeding syndrome. And maybe also in the patients with a, um, a exaggerated use of alcohol or very malnourished. But in fact, cardiac surgery patients, when they spend some time in the coronary care unit and receive a lot of furosemide, are also at risk because they lose phosphate, potassium, and thiamine at a very high rate after only one week. Bariatric surgery has already been mentioned, with particularly also vitamin A being acutely lost sometimes with a paradoxical uh, steatosis worsening into, in, uh, uh, despite eating less. So, in fact, many patients are at risk. The more they have been long, uh, ill for a long time, the more severe their illness has been, the more they have an altered consciousness before ICU admission, and the more there is availability of aggressive feeding interventions, the higher the risk of refeeding syndrome. I used to work in Haiti. I think there my risk for refeeding syndrome was very low because I had no therapeutic interventions. So what can we do to prevent it and to manage it? Well, first of all, try to make people aware. And this kind of talks may be better in, the, um, in a cardiac session or a neuro session because people sitting here probably all know the refeeding syndrome. It's the other ones we should be worrying about. Every patient may be at risk until the file is fully complete and you're sure how many days he's been in the hospital, how many days he's been fasting at home. Often we don't know. Every feeding is feeding. And maybe it's even worse in a setting of tight glycemic control, but this, of course, is just an hypothesis. What we should do, I think, in all truly ill patients receiving support is measure potassium, phosphate, magnesium, and check for fluid overload regularly upon admission in the ICU and initiation of any kind of feeding. And what about the timing and maybe other parenteral micronutrients? Should we just make it foolproof and say not all doctors in training think so we give it to everybody for the first 24 days? Maybe it's a waste. 24 hours, sorry. Maybe it's a waste of material, but maybe it will save some lives. Or do it in the selective high-risk patients, but who are they? Are they recognized by the high nutritional risk, as discussed before by Jean Charles? Or do we wait for deficiencies, deficiencies to become obvious? I think the last option may be dangerous. And what do we give? Well, here again, there is a spectrum. The more likely something is um, dangerous when it's missing, the more we should have a tendency to give it, like is the case for timing, particularly because it's not very toxic, at least not if you do give it for a few days. The more something can be toxic and the less acutely needed, maybe the lower the tendency should be to start it. For many vitamins, we don't really know. We don't have trials. We only have very good old historical data showing what deficiencies can do, but we don't know when it would occur in the ICU. We have to think about it, though. How should we give it technically? Here, I have to admit that our group and myself, we created ourselves a problem because we used to give early PN to everybody, and we just injected the vitamins into it. It was very easy, slow administration, in the lipids, so um, stable and protected from the sunlight. Nowadays, we do this, as you know. Others may not, but we do uh, mostly not give PN in the first week, never, in fact. And so we have no more a vector to give the uh, parental micronutrients. Others have another problem because they, they do give antral nutrition, but they want to give more parental micronutrients. And then again, the question is, how do you give them? It's a very technical question, but a clinical one from daily life. You can give it in a bolus. You avoid all kinds of problems of stability, 
of activity being lost due to sunlight, due to heat. It's the less costly because you can just give it chaka like this. Um, you don't need to prepare or anything. But particularly for the water-soluble vitamins, it is possible, it's probable, that the more you give in the bolus, the more will be wasted in the urine bag or in the ultrafiltration bag of your uh, renal placement machine. This is not proven, but it's very likely. This has been measured also. You can give it in a slow infusion, protected from the sunlight, but this is rather costly if you do it in all patients. It costs a lot. It's small numbers, one euro, but if it's multiplied by a lot, it becomes a lot, as you know, in daily life. So with the help of our head nurse and the pharmacy collaborator, we have this simple protocol. I don't know if it's good or not. Just want to share it with you. Um, where the patients always receive timing during the night, so no more exposure to the sunlight, and apparently the uh, artificial light is not so much of a problem. Slowly, over four hours or more, depending on how long the night is, the trace elements always go into the maintenance fluid, and the vitamins go into the maintenance fluid in the rare case where the maintenance fluid is parental nutrition containing lipids, because then we suppose it's protected from uh, the sun due to the, uh, the uh, white lipids. And else, it, uh, the multivitamins go into the pump of the timing. A pragmatic protocol that may be good or not. We didn't test it, we just do it, because we don't have anything else. The last question is, what about caloric intake? And Jean-Charles helped me by already addressing this study, so I'm, I have no more fear of being in lack of time. Uh, in 2011, in one of the better reviews, Burns wrote, there is in fact no evidence at all to build our tra uh, treatment on. Thanks to Dr. Doig, we have at least now a clue of what might be the best, best way to go in this Refeeding Syndrome Trial Investigator Group. More than 300 patients with the phosphate going below 60, 0.65 upon initiation of feeding in the ICU, a drop more than 0.16, uh, after administration of at least 500 kcal, so phosphorus uh, criteria of refeeding syndrome were included. First remark, there were no criteria like uh, time without feeding before the ICU or before hospitalization, and also no criteria like the number of days in the ICU um, uh, before starting of the feeding. Anyway, all patients received, as explained before, a standardized and very pragmatic and efficient um, timing, multivitamin, and phosphate management. So the only big difference was that the one arm had a very low uh, administration of 20 k an hours for the first 48 hours, being increased on the third day only if, if phosphate uh, improved um, by then, and the other arm had standard generous feeding. And as you can see, there is an important difference between the both arms. This is what we call an epanic-like difference, so it's important. Um, it's like 800 to 1,000 kcal in the first days. The impact on phosphate was significant, uh, statistically significant, but in fact very moderate. And also the impact on phosphate repletion needs was very moderate too, because the protocol was well executed with this uh, compensation and substitution of phosphate. The impact on the glucose and on the insulin needs was very impressive, which, of course, again, is also predictable if you give much more feeding. But this is, in fact, the largest difference between both groups is the hyperglycemia and the increased nutrient needs. Due to the very complex composite primary endpoint, the study is officially negative. This is a problem in uh, studies nowadays that in fact the number of days alive after ICU discharge at day 60, if you know what it means, takes some time, but anyway, a composite endpoint combining length of stay in the ICU and survival uh, was maybe somewhat affected, but not enough to reach significance. Nevertheless, the generous feeding apparently did kill the patients. There's no other way to turn around. It can it was after ICU discharge, the 60 days and 90 days landmark survival, which was dramatically affected. And this is very surprising. Is this really about the refeeding syndrome? I'm not sure. It's about hypophosphatemia. It's one of the manners to identify patients with refeeding. How did the feeding possibly kill the patients? We would say, du jamais vu. It's very rarely seen that you can save life or kill patients with feeding unless you add glutamine. In the discussion of the paper, it's all about phosphate. But in fact, the phosphate between both groups wasn't that different. Maybe 
the hyperglycemia, increased infectious complications, and all these things as observed in EPANIC and TICACOS and PPANIC is more of a clue, although in our studies the patients didn't die due to this. In fact, we don't know. What we do know is that it was safe to go slow. And so maybe it's better, even with a negative result, to respect this and to say, until further notice, you better go slow in these patients with your caloric intake. But to, tomorrow we'll have time to debate further on this with uh, Jean and myself in the afternoon, so stay until the end.